After the Bolshevik successful coup of the newly formed Russian provisional government, a wave of catastrophic and unprecedented reforms swept throughout the Russian state in a matter of months. Of all these changes, the establishment of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission, commonly known as the Cheka, was perhaps the most significant. The Cheka was the first of a succession of Soviet secret police organizations which would not only strengthen in size and scope over the next 40 years, but would also go so far as to define life itself under Soviet-style totalitarianism. Its primary means were violence and intimidation, complemented by constant surveillance, which was aided by unlimited secret informants and endless purges of the population. Being outside of and quite above the law, the power of the Cheka went virtually unchecked. Established on December 5th of 1917 by the Council of the People's Commissars, this was the controlling body of the government, known as Sovnarkom, it came under the leadership of Felix Zerzhinsky, a Polish aristocrat turned Bolshevik. By late 1918, hundreds of Cheka committees had sprung up throughout the RSFSR, officially called the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Note that at this time, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, had not yet been created. Ostensibly set up to protect the revolution from reactionary forces, which is a technical term for all who oppose the new government in both thought and action, including those who were sympathetic to either capitalism, liberalism, monarchism, or were members of the clergy, it rapidly became the primary political tool of repression to be used against all opponents of the communist regime. At the direction of Lenin, the Cheka performed mass arrests of citizens, most of whom were innocent of actual wrongdoing, perpetual imprisonments without cause in both prison cells and concentration camps, a variety of ghastly methods of torture, and executions without trial. In the first month and a half after the October Revolution, the duty of extinguishing the resistance of exploiters was assigned to the Petrograd Military Revolutionary Committee, the VRK. The VRK was given the authority to create new bodies of government which were in turn used to organize food deliveries, appropriate all sorts of wealth, and send its emissaries and agitators into the provinces of Russia. One of its most important functions was the security of revolutionary order and the fight against counter-revolutionary activity. On December 1st, 1917, the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, the VTSIK, reviewed a proposed reorganization of the VRK and the possible replacement of it. On December 5th, the Petrograd VRK was officially dissolved and its functions transferred to the department of the VTSIK. Felix Zerzhinsky was appointed as director. On December 7th, Zerzhinsky and others chosen for the job gathered in the Smolny Institute to discuss the structure of the commission and how it would go about combating counter-revolution and sabotage. The obligations of the commission were to liquidate to the root all of the counter-revolutionary and sabotage activities and all attempts to them in all of Russia, to hand over counter-revolutionaries and saboteurs to the revolutionary tribunals, develop measures to combat them and relentlessly apply them in real-world applications. The commission should only conduct a preliminary investigation. The commission was also tasked with the observation of the press and counter-revolutionary parties, sabotaging officials and other criminals. In other words, all potential opposition to the party were to be closely monitored and, if necessary, charged and arrested. That day, Sovnarkom officials confirmed the creation of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission, thus bringing into existence the Cheka. As its name implied, the Extraordinary Commission had virtually unlimited powers and could interpret them in any way it wished. There were no standardized procedures apart from the stipulation that those who were arrested were supposed to be sent to the military revolutionary tribunals if they were arrested outside of a war zone. Seeing how, due to the ongoing civil war, most of the country was in total chaos, this left an opportunity for a wide range of interpretations. Had the Cheka been made to follow outdated legal processes and normal judicial procedures, it would have been impossible to carry out the necessary purging 
of socially hostile elements. And so, an entirely new type of justice was adopted, that of extrajudicial reprisal. Thus, the Cheka became the first punitive organ in human history which combined in one body investigation, arrest, interrogation, prosecution, trial, and execution of the verdict. An agent of the Cheka was known as a Czechist, dressed in all black leather with long flowing coats and a distinctive blue cap. Such a person commanded instant respect and very real fear, even from high-ranking party members and military men. These Czechists were the foundation upon which the power and might of the Soviet state depended. They were known as the organs of state security. Right from their inception, the Cheka was established with the intention of first acquiring and then maintaining and strengthening an iron grip on the people of Russia. At the direction of Lenin, the Cheka undertook mass arrests, imprisonments, and executions of enemies of the people. In this, the Cheka targeted class enemies, an intentionally vague and ill-defined definition, which included members of the bourgeoisie and the clergy. The first organized mass repression began against the libertarians and the socialists of Petrograd in April of 1918. Over the next few months, well over 800 people were arrested, tortured, and shot without trial. By this time, the Cheka had extended its repression to all political opponents of the communist government. This cemented the idea of a one-party totalitarian state. Initially, resistance was common, owing to the newness of the government and the still strong feelings of animosity and resentment towards it. The civil war was still ongoing, and the Bolsheviks had by no means fully clamped down on the country. In response to this resistance, the Cheka orchestrated a massive retaliatory campaign of repression, executions, and arrests against all opponents of the Bolshevik government in what came to be known as the Red Terror. Implemented by Zhirzhinsky on September the 5th, 1918, the Red Terror was vividly described by the Red Army journal Krasnaya Gazeta. Without mercy, without sparing, we will kill our enemies in scores of hundreds. Let them be thousands. Let them drown themselves in their own blood. For the blood of Lenin and Yuritsky, let there be floods of blood of the bourgeoisie, more blood as much as possible. Indeed, they got what they wished for. Over a little more than four years, the Cheka is thought to have executed at least 200,000 people throughout the former Russian Empire. Some estimates reach as high as 1.3 million. Not all of these executions can be attributed to or traced back to individual executions with or without formally pronounced death sentences. The practice of sinking barges, for instance, loaded with hundreds of uncounted, unregistered, and unidentified socially hostile class elements was sanctioned and carried out by the Cheka. Another method the Cheka used to dispose of socially hostile elements, captured white army soldiers, for instance, was to leave hundreds of unequipped and ill-dressed men on barren islands in the White Sea. In a short while, either the natural elements or starvation would have done the executioner's jobs for them. The full extent of this type of indiscriminate mass murder during and immediately after the Civil War is unknown and never will be known. As early as August of 1918, internal enemies of the government were rounded up and put in concentration camps. In his own words, Lenin can be quoted saying in a telegram to Yevgenia Bosch, Lock up all the doubtful ones in a concentration camp outside the city. And in addition, carry out merciless mass terror and secure the Soviet Republic against its class enemies by isolating them in concentration camps. This was the first time in history the term concentration camp had been used in this context. The mass arrests and immediate confinement of a country's own citizens, as opposed to the confinement of wartime POWs, was a concept conceived by Lenin and carried out by the Cheka. Beginning that same summer in 1918, the Cheka began to pick up, one by one, Mensheviks, anarchists, libertarians, former members of the aristocracy, and SRs, the Bolsheviks' chief political opposition, under the pretense that these were the people responsible for the confusion and disorder plaguing the country. Of course, this was done almost exclusively at night, 
under the cover of darkness. Once arrested, a confession was a near certainty. Like the religious persecutions of the past, the Cheka utilized systematic torture and intimidation. Sleeplessness was used universally, and though it left no physical marks, it was quite as effective as any physical methods which might be applied, and often more so. Of course, that is not all that was done to those unfortunate enough to fall into the hands of eager Czechists. Just about every form of torture imaginable was used at some point or another. This was not only inevitable given the legal and moral structure of the Cheka, but also necessary given the fact that well over nine cases out of every ten were drawn up without regard to whose name would be signed on the dotted line. It was necessary to force a confession from the detainee, regardless of minor details like the facts of the case and the truth of the matter. Incidentally, this was by design. Given the social ideology of the Bolsheviks, the theoretical view of the suspect's guilt was elastic from the very beginning. Truth, in the classical sense, was relative. Subsequently, in his instructions on the use of red terror, the leading Czechist M. Latsis wrote, In the interrogation do not seek evidence and proof that the person accused acted in word or deed against Soviet power. The first question should be, what is his class? What is his origin? What is his education and upbringing? These are the questions which must determine the fate of the accused. At the Ryazan Cheka they shone automobile lights in the prisoners' faces. At Lubyanka they made use of the hot air heating system to fill an unventilated cork-lined cell, first with icy cold and then with boiling hot air. This sometimes reached a point where the prisoners' blood began to ooze through their pores. At this point they would be taken off on a stretcher to sign their confession. And in Georgia they used lighted cigarettes to burn the hands of prisoners under interrogation. In Meteki prison, they pushed prisoners into a cesspool in the dark. In Sukhanovka, prisoners were simultaneously starved on rations one-eighth the typical serving and kept under constant surveillance so that at no point could they sleep even for just one minute. Virtually everyone who was kept at Sukhanovka either killed themselves or went totally insane. It is unlikely that anyone in pre-revolutionary Russia, with the exception of a few radicals, could have guessed that in just a few years, tens of thousands of innocent men and women would have been systematically subjected to the most ruthless, the most barbaric and cold-hearted methods of torture imaginable. In the age of aeroplanes and the telephone, scores of honest men would have their skulls squeezed with iron rings. They would be trussed up naked to be bitten by ants and bed bugs. They would be lowered into an acid bath. And if they were lucky, they would be tortured by being kept from sleeping for a week, by thirst, by starvation, and by being beaten and bludgeoned without mercy. Yet thanks to the imagination of those few, not in the least Lenin himself, the birth of the Cheka and all the evil that was sure to follow was allowed to take place. By the end of the Civil War, all of Russia's political parties had been buried, except the victorious one. And so that the dissolution of these parties would be irreversible, it was necessary that their members should disintegrate and their physical bodies too. Not one citizen of the former Russian state who had ever joined a party other than the Bolshevik party could avoid his fate. Of course, this could not have been done otherwise and without the extrajudicial nature of the Cheka. The importance of the rule of law and its restraining effects on the power of the state and its organizations is more apparent than ever when we consider the effects which its absence had on the operations of the Cheka. Lord Acton's maxim, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, could not have been proven more correct than by the evil deeds of the Cheka and its constituents.